Well, good evening. It is about 7 o'clock. That means it is time for the midweek Bible study here at Santee Circle Church of God. Let me uh, quickly uh, give you some uh, informational items. Please don't forget that you can go to uh, our church website and give online. It's through the tithely ly dot, uh, tithe.ly app. Uh, and you can also just go to santeecirclecog.org to give. Don't forget to download our church app. It is literally our church app, and then you search Santee Circle Church of God. Also, our men's and women's ministries will be meeting again on Sunday night, July the 11th. So please make note of that on your calendars so that you can come and join us. I want to go to the Lord in prayer before we get started tonight, and I want to uh, have a couple uh, requests I want to bring to your attention. First and foremost, please be praying uh, for Brother Jimmy Villanueva, uh, who is, uh, had a little bit of an accident taking down a tree stand and is in the hospital. And also want to uh, pray for Sister Bonnie Gunn and Sister Laura Mae Skipper and their families as well uh, as they're battling still cancer and uh, being homebound. Sister Faye Huff in the nursing home. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. Father, I thank you. You're a very present help in time of trouble. Father, I pray today, God, you would bless this word. You know the needs that have been presented before the body of Christ today. Father, I pray for Sister Laura Mae Skipper. I pray for Sister Faye Huff. I pray for Sister Bonnie Gunn. I pray for Brother Jimmy V, Lord, who is in the hospital tonight. Lord, I pray for each and every one listening under the sound of my voice this message tonight, that it would bring glory and honor unto your name. Father, I pray that you would speak ever so clearly. Hide me behind the cross of Calvary to speak your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be all over uh, tonight in the book of James and in 1 John and in Proverbs. We're still continuing our thought or our series on living wisely in a foolish world. Living wisely in a foolish world. Today I want to start in James chapter number 5. Uh, excuse me, or excuse me, James chapter number 4, I'm sorry, in verse number 6. The Bible says, where God gives more grace... Wherefore, God said, He resists the proud, and He gives grace to the humble. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. That's the second scripture we have heard talking about pride. And then obviously, Proverbs 15 and 25, the Lord will destroy the house of the pride or the arrogant, but he will establish the border of the widow. So I want to talk tonight for a few minutes on this subject. The worst of sins. The worst of sins. You see, during the Middle Ages, a group of monks uh, in that time period wanted to seek the face of the Lord. They decided they wanted to love God with all their hearts, mind, soul, and strength, just as Jesus commanded in Matthew 22. And so they wanted to know God in a more intimate and, and a more uh, detailed way. And so they drew away, they secluded themselves away, and they consecrated themselves to a time of fasting and prayer. They wanted to know what drew them to this life of solace and solitude. And they begin to compile a list of what they referred to as the basic sins where all other sins originated. And they came up with what has now been titled or been known in throughout the world as the seven deadly sins. And you can Google that, the seven deadly sins, and they will list those seven sins to you. The worst and the most dangerous of all sins is the one they listed first on their list. In fact, the number one thing they said most sin originates from is a word called pride. Pride. The Bible says, These six things the Lord doth hate, yea, seven are an abomination unto him. Proverbs 6 and 16. And the first one listed in Proverbs 6 and verse 17 is a proud look, or in some translations, a haughty eyes, which means something of arrogance, something prideful, something arrogant, something that is more along the lines of self and selfishness. You see, God hates the sin of pride above all others because 
it describes people who are full of pride in their eyes. Because what pride does, the reason the Lord hates it the most is because pride will indefer, in essence, will be a competitive nature to God because a lot of the things that pride comes from and the root that pride creates all centers on trying to compete with God. Trying to compete to be your own God. Trying to compete to be God in general. Trying to be in control. So the Lord despises pride. You see, pride heads the list of the seven sins God hates the most because, in fact, I believe it could be one of the worst of sins. So for a few moments, I want to talk just about a couple things about pride. So in order to fully understand pride, we first got to have what is pride? What is the description? What constitutes pride? Pride is the worst of all sins because, in fact, all the way from the beginning of time, it is one of the original sins. And in fact, most scholars would argue that pride is the original sin that entered into the world. Pride is not self-esteem. It's not. Everyone can have self-esteem. In fact, it is good. Listen to me carefully. It is good sometimes for people to have healthy self-esteem. But reality is, Pride is more than that. Pride is, in essence, arrogance. It is having an exaggerated opinion of oneself. You see, I personally, I can't speak for everyone, but I personally struggle with arrogant people. They drive me nuts. I can't stand them. I cannot stand someone who is so full of themselves that they affect everyone else around them. Pride. Pride is one of the words that best describes Satan. You know, the one who fell from heaven. The essence of Satan is revealed in Scripture in the heart of the king of Babylon. Who is completely overtaken by Satan. And in his heart, the king said in Isaiah 14, he said, I will ascend into heaven and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. The king of Babylon is an analogy used of how Satan became Satan. How Satan was so arrogant that he wanted to be like God. Because of pride, Satan led a revolt or a rebellion in the portals of glory. How does Jesus describe this? Well, he tells us in Luke 10 and 18 that I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So one could beg to ask the question, well, how long did it take God to defeat Satan? Well, how, long, how fast is a flash of lightning? <laughs> you see, as quickly as the lightning flashes and bolts across the sky, though it starts from the ground and makes its way heavenly, as it flashes across the sky really quickly, so too was the cataclysmic encounter between God and Satan. Satan reared up against God and that fast he was removed from the portals of heaven. Satan was defeated by Jesus Christ. You see, then Satan began his journey to destroy the works of the Lord. Well, you know the story. Satan led Adam and Eve into sin by appealing to their pride. You know what happened. You see, they were standing there at the garden and Eve was standing there looking at the trees and Satan came to her and said, are you sure, in the form of a serpent, are you sure that God said you couldn't eat that? Are you sure he doesn't want you to eat that? Because he wanted to create rebellion of heart. You see, God had already told Adam and Eve they could not eat of the forbidden fruit lest they would die. But Satan tells them, you shall not surely die. Then he goes on in Genesis 3 and 5 to say, And if you eat it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. How could he say that? Because Satan remembered the last time he tried it. He wanted to be like God and got kicked out of heaven. So in response to try to get back at God or to get even with God, what he decided to do was to take humanity, God's most, most uh, accomplished creation, God's prideful possession, the thing that God formed and fashioned out of his own hands and breathed his own breath inside those bodies. Satan thought the way he could get even or get back at God would be to try to corrupt God's creation by doing the same thing, making them believe they could become God. Isn't that what secular humanism is all about? 
Isn't that what absolute moral truths and values and people in those types of philosophical studies try to get you to believe? You're your own God. You set your own rules. You're your own governor of morality. You see, the very essence of pride is trying to be your own God. People who want to be God will say, I can make my own rules. I'll live like I want. I can live by my own standards. In other words, pride says, I will be my own God and my own moral authority, and no one has to answer. I don't have to answer to one because I set the trend. I set the rules. That is what pride looks like. That's the description of pride. It's about me, narcissistic, narcissism. Have you, have you ever noticed the word sin? S-I-N. Have you ever noticed the word pride? P-R-I-D-E. Both of them have an odd number of letters. Therefore, that means there is a middle letter. In sin, the middle letter is I. In the word pride, P-R-I-D-E, the middle letter is I. The reason pride and sin go hand in hand together because every time I sin and every time pride is involved, it somehow centers around I, me. I want it. I want it. I do it. I create it. I long for it. I covet it. I lie. I cheat. I steal. Sin is about an I problem. It's an I-ism. It's, it's all about me. Pride is all about me, an I problem. So let's talk about the dangers created by pride. Well, the first thing you have to understand is pride will hurt you spiritually. Pride will hurt you spiritually. Proverbs 16 and 5 says, Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to God. There is only one cause for not being close to God. There's only one reason people should not be close to God, and that is their own pride. Their own pride. I said to you in Proverbs 16 and 5, everyone is proud in their own heart, which is an abomination to God. You see, another word that people like to use is ego. Ego. You know, we'll say someone is just full of themselves. They got a really big ego. They're so confident in themselves. That is the same word as pride. Egotistical. Pride. Egoism. Pride. You see, someone has once said that the word ego, if you were to use that as an acronym, it literally stands for the following, edging God out. Ego, E, edging, G, God, O, out. Edging God out. So we know, scripturally speaking, and we know from experiment, experiences and experiential situations, that pride hurts us spiritually. We also know pride hurts us relationally. Pride will hurt your relationships. In fact, pride is the basic conflict in all relationship issues. Proverbs 13 and 10 tells us that the pride or the insolence, the insolent comes nothing, excuse me, through insolence comes nothing but strife. Through insolence. That word insolence means pride. Through pride comes nothing but strife. Every husband, every wife, in my opinion, should learn this verse. Through pride, through arrogance, through insolence, through selfish endeavors comes nothing to good, nothing of good, but only strife. Comes strife. When we have a problem with pride, we clash with our family, our friends, our co-workers, our associates, our church members. Because pride makes us demanding and uncompromising. When you're full of pride, we're not willing to compromise. We're just full of demands. Pride causes problems because it destroys relationships with children and parents. Many parents make their children miserable by pressuring them to be all-stars and all-American athletes and all-conference and all-academic and sports and all-academic in, in, uh, in their scholastic endeavors. They make their achievements. They want their children to 
to do so well because they think that their child's achievements make them look good as a parent. That is nothing but pride. So what if little Johnny does his best and only makes a C? If that's the best little Johnny can do, then don't make little Johnny feel bad for it because you want him to have straight A's because you're just more prideful and arrogant because you want to go brag about how he made the dean's list or the principal's list or the AB honor roll system. It's a pride thing, not a proud thing of your child. You see, pride causes problems. When we are prideful, we become obnoxious and rude. You ever met those people in restaurants? They're so impolite, they're demanding, they're rude to the waitress or the waiter. You know, I have heard it said that rudeness is a weak person intimidate. In, excuse me, rudeness is a weak person's imitation of strength. A rude, rudeness is literally a weak, weak person's imitation of strength. They have to be rude to make themselves look bigger and badder than they are. Pride also will hurt you emotionally. You see, pride causes us to try to look more successful and to oppress others. Well, we like that look of looking better than everybody else. We want the promotion. We want the better job, the bigger job, the bigger house, the bigger car, the bigger whatever. We want to look good on paper. But what if we don't? What if we don't look so good on paper? What if that's not the goal? What if we can't keep up with the Joneses or the Smiths at all costs? You see, if you're not careful, pride will have you stressed out all the time and be miserable with yourself and with others. Luke 12 and 15 says this, For one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. What Jesus is saying is, it doesn't matter how much materialistic things you gain, at the end of the day, that is not what matters most. Not how much money you have in the bank. Not how many cars are in the driveway. Not how big square footage the house is. That means nothing at the end of life. In fact, I reminded of the scripture Jesus said to his disciples. What does it profit a man? If he gave the whole world and loses his own soul. And I think that applies more not just to souls in, in terms of, of, of someone trying to go and do to please everybody else. I think it could, could be about a, a, achieving wealth and other things. What does it profit a man if he's got the biggest house, the most cars, the greatest wealth, and he dies and goes to hell? What does it matter? It was pointless. It served no purpose. You see, pride will hurt us emotionally. But you know that also pride will hurt you financially. It'll cripple you financially. Why is a person's debt one of the greatest, well, excuse me, why is personal debt one of the greatest problems in America? Why is personal, why is personal debt one of the leading contributors and factors to divorces and marriages? Why is it that year after year we see people struggling with numbers of personal numbers growing of personal, uh, excuse me, of, of personal bankruptcies and people filing for chapter 13? Why? In general, the answer is pride. Want more stuff. Want more assets. Want more goods. Want to look good. It's all about pride. You see, the average American is far more interested in looking successful rather than being successful. There's a lot of people want to look like they got it all figured out, but boy, they ain't got nothing figured out. Hello? Come on, somebody. They want you to think they got it. They want you to think it's all good. They want you to think it's under control, but they don't have it all together. You see, that's a pride thing. In Proverbs 16 and 18, the Bible said pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. We just read to you earlier out of Proverbs 6 and 17 about how it's a prideful look. And we read to you out of Proverbs and other parts of Proverbs where 16 and 5 that, that every, everyone is proud in heart. But by verse 18 of chapter 16, the Bible says that pride goes before destruction. And your haughtiness, your arrogance, your insolence goes before your ultimate fall. 
You see, that is the dangers of pride. But I also want you to understand how can you destroy pride? How can you overcome being arrogant and prideful and egotistical, narcissistic, and narcissism? How can you supersede it? How can you overcome the struggles? I already have shared with you that pride is dangerous and that pride is also, I gave you the description of how it's arrogant and self-centered and it's an I problem. And I told you the dangers of the spiritual and relationally and emotional and financial crippling effects of pride. But if you say, Pastor, how can I not be so arrogant? Well, I want to talk about that. I want to talk to you for a minute for the next few moments towards the conclusion of this study tonight. How can you stop pride? How can you eradicate pride? No, it's not as easy as a three-step program. <laughs> I wish it was. I wish I could give you a little uh, uh, three-point outline and it's just going to let you know that as soon as you do this, you'll never have pride again. <laughs> that's not how that works. In fact, that's, that's actually false in all ways. You see, one thing that can destroy pride in our lives is something called humility. I read it to you earlier in Scripture. I read to you where it says that God will destroy the house of the prideful. But I read to you out of James where the Bible said, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Meaning humility is the weapon of choice to combat in the war combat in the warfare against pride. Humility can push pride right out of our hearts. But how do you become humble? How do you make sure your life is pleasing unto the Lord? How do you make sure that you keep your perceptors and your receptors to know that Anytime pride is creeping in, it goes off to let you know as a sensor that you are getting ready to be in a danger zone. Well, the first thing is real simple. You first got to just recognize that you're arrogant or prideful in your life. You see, I have heard from people like Dr. Phil and others, and psychologists who have done various studies, that in essence, the greatest recipient or the greatest way to overcome a problem in life is first to recognize that you as an individual in fact have a problem now we don't we don't like to think like that but the reality of the fact is that if you don't think you're prideful if you don't think you're arrogant if you don't think you have issues if you don't think there's nothing wrong with you then it's going to be hard to overcome it if you don't even think there's a problem so in life, we have to get to a point where we first say, yeah, you know what, I do have some issues with pride. But oftentimes, it's amazing how often people are really blinded by their pride. But Jeremiah 17 and 9 tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Whether we want to admit it or not, and whether we recognize it or not, the prophet Jeremiah tells us the heart by nature is deceitful above all things and by nature is already wicked because of the sin problem in the world. It's desperately wicked. You see, arrogant people don't know that they have an issue or a problem with pride. They're so arrogant they can't see it. I'm reminded of that scripture of not to, do not look at the speck in your brother's eye when you have a two by four in your own eye because it is amazing to me, in essence, how simplistic that scripture may sound to say in res and, 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 re and, and uh, reciting and resuscitation, uh, but, but it's so hard to live by. We're so easy to pick on everybody else's problems not realizing we got problems in our own eyes. You see, our hearts are deceitful. But we must learn how to pray like the psalmist did in Psalms 139. Search me, O God, and know my inward being, or my innermost parts. Know my heart. Know who I am. Lord, I don't want to be this man. 
Search my heart and know that I've made mistakes, but God, I don't want to be like this anymore. To recognize pride in our lives, we must ask God to show us any signs of pride in our lives and then confess it as sin. We must declare it to the Lord. Lord, I screwed up. I've messed up. God, forgive me. I'm sorry. Another way to combat it is to understand and remember the source of all blessings. To remember why we are where we are. To remember, why do I even have a house? Why do I even have a car that drives? Why do I have the ability to buy clothes? Why do I get to go out and eat from time to time and have the financial means and resources to do so? It's a real simple answer. God. <laughs> God. The reason I can do it is God. God is the reason. I'm not healthy because I took vitamins. I'm healthy because God gave someone the knowledge and ability to, to figure out vitamins are essential to my survival, but it was still a gift from God. God did it. I serve God. It's a God thing. You see, everything you and I have comes from God. There was once a story of a man who used to say, I have earned everything I have with these two hands. And he lifted up his hands and he showed him his hands. You know, I've often thought when I heard that story, did anybody ever ask him where he got his hands from? He's walking around, everything I have I got from my own two hands. Really? How did you get hands? Who gave you the hands? Who gave you a mind, a brain? And the talents and abilities to be able to become so successful. Who gave you that functionality? I think if you go back to the book of 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verse 17, we find the answer. Because in 1 Timothy 6 and 17 it says, Command those who are rich in this present age to not be haughty, not be arrogant, not be prideful, nor to trust in the uncertainty of riches, because they're fleeing, fleeting, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Listen to what he's saying. Command those who've got riches, who are the wealthy, not to become arrogant, haughty, prideful. Don't think they've done it themselves. And tell them not to trust in the fleetingness of riches because, you know, just quickly as they got them, the, mis the fortunes can turn to misfortunes and the tides can turn. But tell them to trust in God, the living God who gives all things richly for enjoyment. But, you know, I think there's another way that we can combat pride. We can replace our selfishness with service. Instead of wanting to be served, learn to serve. Jesus, in fact, said, I did not come to serve, but in fact to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. If the Son of the living God said he came down from the portals of glory so that he could serve people, who am I to say, no, nah, that ain't going to work. I'm not going to serve. You're going to serve me instead. I've often seen and heard stories of businesses that have been successful. They're in the earliest, early stages of the game. The CEO and the CFO and the, all of the, the upper echelon of that company at one time was on the floor with the rest of the people and working beside them and endeared themselves to the common laborer so that those people were willing to work for them for years and years and years because they had seen those people put their hand to the plow and grind with them. See, if you, won't get, if you want somebody to do something for you, you first must learn how to do something for others. God said, don't do anything out of selfish ambition. Don't do anything out of selfish wants and desires. But he said, do everything in humility. Prefer your brother. Prefer one another. Let them be ahead of you. You see, serving others helps you forget about being arrogant because when you're serving other people, you'll start remembering how blessed we really are and we'll forget about how arrogant we are. Just hours before Christ's crucifixion, Jesus and his disciples were observing the Passover meal which Jesus transformed into what we call today the Lord's Supper and that institution of the sacraments of the church that we celebrate and ordinances of the church of the Lord's Supper. 
Jesus and his disciples were sitting there reclining at the table and according to Luke 2 and 24, there became a great dispute among the disciples as to who would be the greatest or, and who would be the least. Who's going to be the highest ranking disciple in Jesus' kingdom of heaven? And they got into this dispute, and this discussion and dis, uh, disagreement, if you will. But over in the corner of the room, near the door, there was an untouched jar or a pitcher of water and an empty basin and a towel. Where it was left there because every room and when a house there in that time period in, in, Babylon, I mean, in Bible days, in the Palestinian days, they would have that so that when guests would arrive, a servant would come out, wash your feet, dry them with the towel so that when you entered in the house, you wouldn't track in all the dirt and dust and grime into the, to the house. The servant's job was to wash your feet at the door. So Jesus noticed it in the room. And the Bible says that upon hearing the prideful debate among the disciples, Jesus politely excuses himself and he slides his chair back and he gets up from the table and he wraps a towel around him and takes out his outer cloak and he puts that towel around his waist and he pours water in a basin. And according to John 13 and 5, he begins to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with that towel. The Son of the living God is now washing the disciples' feet, the feet of men who will one day turn their back on him. Sitting at that table is also the one who betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. The creator of the universe is washing humanity's fleshly, dirty feet. You see, the Son of God is doing for them what they were too prideful and arrogant to do for him and to one another. If you've never been to a good foot washing service, you don't know what it means. You learn to be humble really quick in foot washing service. It'll humble you. The disciples are astonished. Their master is serving as a foot washer. And when Jesus finishes, he asks them if they understand what he has done for them. Then what he does next, is amazing. He tells them, a servant is not greater than his master. Wow. Wow. A servant is not greater than the master. You see, I am so glad Jesus didn't have a issue, or didn't have a pride problem himself. That's why he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. You see, he became the ultimate model of humility, the opposite of pride. So today, our op the way to fight pride is to be humble and follow the example of Jesus Christ. He didn't have to prove anything or impress us. He was just who he was because he was God, but he made sure that he was free to serve others. You see, pride is a sign of insecurity, and insecure people can't serve others because they want to be served or want the spotlight. So pride is dangerous spiritually, relationally, emotionally, financially. But in order to destroy the greatest of all sins, that is pride, we must recognize we've got a problem. Remember where the source of our blessings have come from and replace selfishness with service. Proverbs 18 and 12 tells us, Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty. Before honor is humility. Before destruction, the heart of a man is is arrogant. Before he falls, he is so full of confidence in himself. Pastor, are you saying I can't have confidence? Are you saying I shouldn't have good self-esteem? No, I'm telling you, don't be so full of yourself that you push God out. Don't have ego edging God out. Because the Bible said before honor is humility. So today, I want you to remember that the worst of all sins, in my opinion, centers on pride. The, sin, the, the middle letter of sin is I. The middle letter of pride is I. The common denominator in both pride and sin is I. Me. As we close tonight, I know that this has been a little bit shorter of a Bible study tonight, but I wanted to quickly just share a word from the Lord with you tonight and give you the opportunity to 
feast and, and just go back and read these scriptures and go back and think about it for a moment and let this be a time of self Bible study or self reflection. I'd like for you to maybe journal these notes down and, and go back and just let this word sink in and ponder it and, and spend some time in prayer. And so I want to pray a closing prayer, but I would like you in this segment of portion of our service is over to spend the additional time just praying for a few minutes and talking to God. Father, I have done the best of my ability to preach your word today. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my God and blessed Redeemer. May you bless us and keep us and your face shine upon us. Be gracious to us. Lift up your countenance upon us and give us the peace of God that surpasses all human understanding and guard our hearts to your return. God, let this word resonate and sink into the hearts of the believer. Father, I thank you for being God. Thank you for being Father and friend. Father, I pray that as we get ready to finish this segment of portion of our program, God, you would let this word resonate into the hearts of the believers. Bring us back safely on Sunday at the next appointed time. Let us continue to hold on to the hope that lies within us. Hope, hold on, pandemics in. Hope, hold on, problems in. Hope, hold on, God's promises are eternal. Give us the hope that we find in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people together said, Amen and Amen. Don't forget, our services on Sunday morning, 11 a.m. Uh, we will be live again online, Santee Circle COG on Facebook and YouTube. Don't forget that we also, uh, you can go back and watch these services after they have been recorded. I pray that something is said or done tonight that will have blessed you and encouraged you and helped you along your spiritual journey and your faith. I love you. I'm praying for you. God bless you tonight. Amen.